welcome to chapter three, part three. Uh, today we are going to cover molar mass, um, some stoichiometric calculations kind of, or like our first kind of go at stoichiometric calculations. Um, and then we'll look at mass percent as well as how to um, use the mole ratio as a conversion factor. And then we'll wrap up by talking about empirical and molecular formulas. So lots of things to cover today. It's a pretty math heavy day, just giving you a heads up. Okay, first thing we need to do is calculate the molar mass of a compound. This is something you've likely done before. Uh, and so to calculate the molar mass of calcium carbonate, we have in calcium carbonate, we have one calcium, one carbon, and three oxygens. So the mass, as you might predict, would be the mass of one calcium, one carbon, and three oxygens. So I always lay it out like this, um, just kind of when you're learning how to do it. You put your elements uh, down here on the left that you have. So we have calcium, carbon, and oxygen. We have one calcium, one carbon, and three oxygens. And you're going to multiply that by the mass of each of those elements on the periodic table. So calcium is 40.08, carbon is 12.01, and oxygen is 16. And then once you multiply that out, you can add them all together, and this is your molar mass of calcium carbonate. Um, and so we'll write it out as 100.09 grams, or uh, sometimes you'll write it out as grams per mole. Um, so we can use this as a conversion factor in our calculations. <clears throat> we have 100.09 grams of calcium is equal to one mole of calcium, sorry, of calcium carbonate is equal to one mole of calcium carbonate. Um, and so this would be just the same as like if we were, you know, doing our other calculations and we were saying, okay, maybe, you know, for carbon, 12.01 grams of carbon is equal to one mole of carbon. So when we have an element, we use the mass on the periodic table to equal one mole. When we have a compound, we're going to use the molar mass equal to one mole. So here's an example of how we might use this. This says how many molecules of nitrogen dioxide are in 365 grams of nitrogen dioxide. So since we're starting with mass in the beginning of our, our train track, the beginning of our dimensional analysis, right? 365 grams of nitrogen dioxide. And we know that grams has to cancel grams. So we're gonna need some kind of a mass down here. And if this was an element, we would just go look for the mass on the periodic table, but it's not, this is a compound. So we need to find the molar mass. Um, so we would, you know, do the whole thing just like we would before, nitrogen and oxygen. We have one and two. We multiply that by their masses. And then multiply that out, add them up. So there's our molar mass, 46.01 grams per mole. So that, that mass is going to go down here, 46.01 grams of nitrogen dioxide, uh, and that's equal to one mole of nitrogen dioxide. So now we have grams of nitrogen dioxide canceling grams of nitrogen dioxide. We're left with moles. So now we need to get from moles to molecules. And the way that we are going to do that is we are going to use Avogadro's number. Before, we had used it as 6.02, um, we'll use 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, um, and we had used atoms is equal to one mole. But remember, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of anything can equal one mole. And in this case, we're going to use 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules um, is equal to one mole. So when it's an element, we will use atoms. And when it's a compound, we will use molecules. Okay, so that's just a little bit different terminology. So now we can go ahead and continue our train track here. So we have one mole of nitrogen dioxide is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of nitrogen dioxide. Um, and make sure you don't abbreviate molecules, M-O-L or M-O-L-E. Um, sometimes I'll abbreviate it M-O-L-E-C, but at that point you might as well just write out the whole thing. Um, if you shorten it anymore, people are gonna think you're writing moles. Okay, so now we have our train track all set up. 
and we can go ahead and calculate it. So we'll multiply by everything on the top, divide by everything on the bottom, and round for significant figures, right? Always round for significant figures. Um, so we'll get 4.78 times 10 to the 24th molecules of nitrogen dioxide. And remember, for our answers, you always need to have your answer rounded to the correct number of significant figures, um, as well as the unit and the compound. Okay, another type of calculation we can do is mass percent. Uh, and mass percent is pretty straightforward. The way that it's gonna go is that the mass percent of the element is going to be the mass of the element divided by the mass of the compound, okay? Um, so don't make this hard. So the mass of the element um, that's in that compound and then the mass over the molar mass is essentially how it works. And this um, is pretty straightforward when we show an example. So here, this first one it says calculate the mass percent of oxygen and calcium carbonate. So before, we had already calculated the molar mass of calcium carbonate to be 100.09 grams per mole. Um, but what we need is the mass of the oxygen and calcium carbonate. So I'm going to go back a couple slides. So if we look here, um, this was where we calculated the molar mass, and we need to put the mass of oxygen on the top. Do not use the mass from the periodic table, not the 16. That's not going to help us. You need to use the total mass of oxygen in that compound. So when we're doing the mass percent of oxygen, we're going to do the mass of oxygen... So we're essentially doing grams of oxygen over grams of calcium carbonate, and then we'll multiply by 100. So our mass percent is going to be our mass of oxygen, so that's our 48 grams, divided by our molar mass of the compound times 100. And when we multiply all that out, and again, rounding for significant figures, we should have 4 out of this one, we are going to get 47.96 percent oxygen. So that's our mass percent. And you could do the mass percent for all of them. You could do it for carbon, you could do it for calcium. And then if you wanted to go back and check your work, right, all of those percents should add up to 100 or something pretty darn close. Maybe it's going to add up to 100.01 .01 because of rounding errors. But it should add up to something pretty close to 100 percent. So that would be how we can do that mass percent. Um, we can use that mass percent as a conversion factor too. So if, you know, in this example, if we wanted to find out how many grams, um, if we have 10 grams of calcium carbonate, how many grams of oxygen are present, we can use that 47.96% um, of oxygen as a conversion factor. So there's actually two different ways to solve this problem. I'm gonna show you both, but this first one we are going to do with the mass percent. So let's say we have 10 grams of calcium carbonate. Okay, so 10.0 grams of calcium carbonate. And when we use our percents, this 47.96% of oxygen, that's telling us for every 100 grams, you know, 100 grams of calcium carbonate, 47.96 grams are going to be oxygen. That's, we're going to use our percent like this, okay? Because that'd be true, right? If we had 100 grams of calcium carbonate and it was 47.96% oxygen, then 47.96 grams would be oxygen. So the reason I'm writing it like this down at the bottom is so that I can use it in this train track. So if we have 10 grams of calcium carbonate for every 100 grams of calcium carbonate, we have... 47.96 grams of oxygen. And that will get us our answer, right? Rounding for sig figs, we're going to get 4.80 grams of oxygen. Um, you might be thinking that's a lot of work and that you could have just done it like this, right? If you have 10.0 grams of, you know, your compound, and we know 47.96% of it is oxygen, then you can do it like that, and 4.80 grams bunch of different ways to do this exact same problem. Either way is totally fine. Whatever makes you happy. Whatever makes more sense to you. Okay, um, when we are looking at um, something like water, right? And maybe we're asking how much oxygen is in water. It's similar to asking how many leaves are on a given number of clovers. 
So let's say we have three leaf clovers. We're not lucky. We didn't find any four leaf clovers. Um, and we all raise, you know, we have we have all these three leaf clovers. And say we had 14 clovers. And I want to know how many leaves. Okay, so we know there are one, two, three. Three leaves for every one clover. Okay? And we could figure that out, right? So we could say, okay, if I have 14 clovers, um, we'll do that. 14 clovers. And for every one, you know, clover, I have three leaves, right? We can multiply that out and figure out, okay, you know, I have 42 leaves on my clovers. Okay, so similarly, we can do that, you know, with figuring out how many atoms are in a given amount of molecules. So if we look at, um, like, carbon dioxide, we're thinking about it like a clover, right? For every one carbon dioxide, I have two oxygen atoms, and for every one carbon dioxide, I have one carbon atom. And so these subscripts down at the bottom are telling us how many atoms we have in a given number of molecules. Or if we were working in moles, for every, you know, that subscript is telling you for every one mole of your compound, how many moles of your individual elements you have. Okay, so we can use these as conversion factors when we start to do um, calculations. So back to that exact same problem that we were working on before. It says how many moles and then grams of oxygen are in 10 grams of calcium carbonate? So let's figure out how many moles of oxygen. So if we have 10.0 grams of calcium carbonate, first thing, anytime we're in grams and we're looking for moles, we're always going to have to convert this into moles first. So we'll go ahead and use the molar mass and we'll convert that into moles of calcium carbonate. And now we can use our new conversion factor, right? In every one mole of calcium carbonate, we have a couple things. We have one mole of calcium, we have one mole of carbon, and we have three moles of oxygen, right? Because we're looking at these subscripts here. Okay, so we're looking for moles of oxygen. So we're gonna say, okay, for every one mole of calcium carbonate, we have three moles of oxygen because of that subscript. Okay, and then we can go ahead, because our first one just asked us how many moles, we can go ahead and multiply that out, round for sig figs. We're going to get 0 0.300 moles of oxygen. And then if we wanted to figure out how many grams of oxygen, we could continue that train track, um, or I'm just going to start from where we left off, our moles of oxygen, and then we can just use um, the molar mass of oxygen on the periodic table. And we can figure out, okay, we have 4.80 grams of oxygen. Okay, so this is another way of doing that exact same problem. And we're always getting the same answer, right? 4.80 grams, we got 4.80 grams here and here. So there's a bunch of different ways to solve this particular problem. If you have the mass percent, then this way uh, is probably a little bit faster. If you don't have the mass percent, you could go ahead and calculate it. But if you don't have the mass percent, then this way is probably a little bit faster. But either way, two different ways of solving this exact same problem, or three different ways really, um, of solving the exact same problem. So whichever way works best for you. Okay, our last and kind of most challenging topic for today is empirical and molecular formulas. Uh, and this may be something new to this class, whereas the other stuff you may have seen before. Um, so we have two different ways of talking about um, formulas for our compounds. So we have molecular formulas and empirical formulas. And molecular formulas will show you the total number of atoms uh, in that molecule. So if we look, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. That's a really common one. Um, the empirical formula will always be the lowest whole number ratio of the elements. So if you look in hydrogen peroxide, there's two hydrogens and two oxygens. So they can both be divided by two. So that means our empirical formula will just be this one to one ratio. Um, for every one hydrogen in that molecule, we have one oxygen. If we look at benzene, C6H6, both of those can be divided by six, so we get CH. Or butane, right, C4H10, both of those can be divided by two, so we get C2H5. 
So our molecular formula always tells us the total number of elements uh, in the molecule, whereas our empirical formula is showing us the lowest whole number ratio. Um, and if we look, though, see we have CH um, twice here. Okay, because it's just showing us this ratio. They are different compounds, because if we go back, this came from C6H6, and this one came from C2H2, and they're totally different. Benzene is totally different from acetylene. They have really nothing in common other than the fact they're both hydrocarbons, and they both have this CH ratio. So some molecular formulas will have the same empirical formulas. So we can't identify our compound based on its empirical formula because it's just telling us the ratio. We need to use the molecular formula, and sometimes things can even have the same molecular formula. Then we look at structure. But um, the molecular formula is going to tell us a lot more about this compound than the empirical formula will. Um, so just be careful there. But the, the empirical formula times some number will always give us the molecular formula. And the molec and the molec this number here has to be a whole number. Okay, It's never going to be you know, one and two thirds. It's always going to be a whole number. So like here, to get back from, you know, to get back to benzene, we multiply by six. To get back to acetylene, we multiply by two. It's always going to be a whole number ratio, okay? So let's figure out how to find these empirical formulas. This is going to be um, some of the trickier calculations for this chapter. So make sure you pay really close attention here. Um, this is going to be a series of steps that you can follow and then um, to always get your right answer. A lot of you guys uh, that are strong in math will like this because as long as you always do the same series of steps, you will always come out to the exact right answer, which is really nice. Um, so I'm going to give you the series of steps here. It will make more sense though in the example problem following. So if you're like, man, I'm lost, that's okay. Just hang in there. So the first thing you're going to do is it's going to give you um, percentages of elements. It'll say, okay, your, you know, your compound is this percent carbon, this percent oxygen, this percent hydrogen, and you're going to convert all of those percentages to grams. And essentially, it's going to be like what we did earlier with our percent oxygen in calcium carbonate when we said, okay, if we have, you know, if we have 47.96% oxygen, that means for every 100 um, grams of our compound, we have 47.96 grams of oxygen. So we're going to take all of our percentages. We're going to assume we have 100 grams of our compound. And so we're just going to use the percentages as grams. So if it says it's 14% carbon, then you're going to say we have 14 grams of carbon. That's it. Um, if it's already in grams, you can skip this step. Then you're gonna convert grams to moles. You're gonna do a bunch of little train tracks and you're gonna convert your grams into moles using the molar mass of each of the elements. So then instead of having grams of all of your elements, you're going to have moles of all of your elements. Then you're going to look and see which one of those gave you the smallest number of moles. And then you're going to take that number and divide all of the other numbers by that number. And then you're going to multiply all of those to get a whole number if they are not already. Sometimes they'll come out in all whole numbers, which is great, and you won't have to do this step four. Um, but if they come out to like two and a half or one and two thirds, you're going to multiply by some number to get them all into whole numbers. Just make sure you are multiplying all of them and not just the one that's not a whole number. Um. This example problem. So in this example, we have ibuprofen and we have um, the percent carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it wants to know what is the empirical formula of ibuprofen. So the first step is to take all of these percentages and use them as mass. So if you'll think back uh, to when we were doing the percent oxygen and calcium carbonate, we had one example where we used that 47.96% oxygen and we said, okay, well, that essentially means if we had 100 grams of the compound, then we would have 47.96 grams of oxygen. So in this example, um, we have our percents of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We are just going to use those as grams. So we have 7.569 grams 
of, oh, sorry, 70, let's try this again, 75.69 grams of carbon, 8.80 grams of hydrogen, and 15.51 grams of oxygen. So that's what that first step means. It says use the percents as grams. So now we're going to go ahead and take all of those grams and we are going to turn them into moles. And we're going to do that by using the molar mass of the element from the periodic table. So for carbon, carbon we're going to use 12.01 grams. Um, here I'm using four significant figures in the mass because I have four significant figures in my percentage. If I had more significant figures in my percentage, I would need to use more significant figures in my mass because we don't want to limit our sig figs based on the mass of our element. So we have 12.01 grams, one mole, and then we have 1.01 grams. So for each one of these, I'm taking the molar mass of that element from the periodic table um, and I'm turning it into moles of our element. So if we go through and we you know, multiply the top, divide the bottom for each one of these, and remember, keep your sig figs because they'll help you out. All right. So there was that step. The next step is the one that was worded a little bit tricky. So it says you're going to look at each one of these numbers of moles. So we have essentially 6.3 moles of carbon, 8.7 moles of hydrogen, <clears throat> and 0.97 moles of oxygen. And you're going to pick the one that is the smallest. So that would be our moles of oxygen. And then we're going to go through and divide each one of these moles by that number. So we'll divide this one by 0.9694. So we're dividing all of those up. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and continue down here on the bottom. So when we do 0 0.6302 moles of carbon divided by 0.9694, we get 6.5 carbons. If we do the same thing, right, that 8.71 moles of hydrogen divided by 0.9694, we are going to get um, 8.98 hydrogens. Um, and that is close enough right there that we could just round that and we could say that that is nine. Um, a good rule of thumb is if you're in about 0.1 of a whole number, then you can round it. If you're farther off, like this carbon is 0.5 away from a whole number, then you need to leave it alone. And I'll show you how to deal with that. And then for the oxygen, 0.964 divided by 0.964, that's going to be one oxygen. So these are our ratios. We have six and a half carbons to nine hydrogens to one oxygen, but we can't have um, not whole numbers. So if you think about 6.5, that is really thinking like 13 halves, right, fraction-wise. So in order to get rid of that decimal or to get rid of that fraction, we need to multiply this by two to get a whole number. So we're going to multiply all of them by two. So that will give us 13 carbons, 18 hydrogens, and two oxygens. Now we have them all as whole numbers and we can write our empirical formula, which is C13H18O2. Right, so all of these numbers here that we solved for, those are all the subscripts of um, you know, the elements in our empirical formula of ibuprofen. So the first step, like we said, we're going to take all of our masses, turn them into percents, divide by the molar masses to get them to moles, divide by the smallest number of moles to get our ratio, and then you may have to multiply by some number to get them into whole numbers. And then you have your subscripts. So that's for em empirical formulas. We also have molecular formulas. And to get a molecular formula, like we talked about before, the molecular formula is always going to be um, the empirical formula multiplied by some number, right? The empirical formula is the lowest common ratio of all of those uh, numbers. The molecular formula is more the true formula, right? The, the actual numbers of elements in those compounds. Okay, so the molecular formula is a multiple of the empirical formula. We're going to multiply by some whole number. 
To determine the molecular formula, you need to know the empirical formula, just like we found before, and the molar mass of the compound, like the true molar mass. And this is how it may be worded. So here's an example. It says the empirical formula of caffeine is that, and we have the molar mass of caffeine there, and it says calculate the molecular formula. So we can find the molecular formula as long as we have the empirical formula, which sometimes you may need to solve for, um, and then we need to have the molar mass of the real compound. So it says the first step is to calculate the empirical formula mass, or the molar mass. So we just calculate the molar mass for this, right? And we have, you know, four carbons, five hydrogens, two nitrogens, and an oxygen. If we multiply those up, add them all together, we're going to get that that molar mass is 97.10 grams per mole. And then we are going to, um, we're always going to do molecular divided by empirical. And that will always give us some whole number. Okay, so our molecular molar mass is 97, sorry, 94.19 grams per mole. And our empirical molar mass is 97.10 grams per mole. And when we divide those up, we get two, which means that in order to get the um, molecular formula, we are going to multiply all of the subscripts in our empirical formula by two. So you can think about it like this. So we have C4, H5, N2O. We're going to multiply all of that by two. So we're going to get C8, H10, N4, O2. And so that would be the molecular formula for caffeine. So sometimes this um, process may be combined with the, the problem on the previous page. It may say, here's all the percentages, and the molecular molar mass is this. So you'll have to go through and find the empirical formula and then calculate the molar mass of that and then do this process where you do molecular divided by empirical to get the number and then multiply the empirical by that number. So um, like I said, this could be all combined. It's a lot of steps, it's a lot of math, but the good news is if you always do the same series of steps, it is always going to come out correctly. Uh, so I actually enjoy doing these types of problems. So we have one more um, way that these empirical and molecular formulas show up, and they are via combustion reactions. And in a combustion reaction, we have a hydrocarbon, which means something with carbon and hydro, uh, hydrogen. Sometimes it'll also have oxygen. But a hydrocarbon reacts with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide and water. And it's always going to have this exact same formula, right? Something, this is the only thing that changes, something is going to react with O2 to produce CO2 and H2O. Those always stay the same. It's just this first one that changes. And then based on what this first one is, uh, that's going to alter your coefficients. But they're always going to be um, reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water every single time. And the reason that this is cool is that we can take some unknown hydrocarbon um, and then we can burn it in a furnace. And we'll have as much oxygen as we want, but we'll just, we'll just keep burning this hydrocarbon. And after we burn this hydrocarbon, we can send it through these two different absorbers. We can send it through one that absorbs water and then the next one that absorbs carbon dioxide. And we can actually figure out how much water and carbon dioxide are being produced from burning this hydrocarbon. And once we know that, we can actually back calculate and figure out, okay, based on the amount of water and carbon dioxide that are produced, how much, uh, or sorry, what exactly was the hydrocarbon that we burned, which is neat. Um, so you can figure out, you know, say you have some fuel, you don't know what, what it is, right? You can stick the fuel in the furnace. Um, and like I said, this will always be a hydrocarbon. You can stick it in there and you can burn it. You can absorb the water and carbon dioxide and then, you know, weigh them figure out how much was produced, and then use that to figure out, okay, what is this mystery fuel? So here's an example of how to do that. This is going to be very similar to the process that we did before, but it's adding on a first step to deal with the carbon dioxide and the water, okay? 
So it says, um, upon combustion, this is our sample. This is our unknown fuel that we're sticking into this furnace. And it said it combined only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It produced this much carbon dioxide and this much water. And it wants to know, find the empirical formula of the compound. Well, if you'll recall, in order to do the empirical formula calculations, we need to have masses of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We don't have that right now. Instead, we have the mass of carbon dioxide and the mass of water. But we'll use the mass of carbon dioxide to figure out how much carbon there was. We'll use the mass of water to figure out how much hydrogen there was. And then we will use subtraction to figure out how much oxygen there was. Um, so the reason that we can't, um, hang on, let me write this down. The reason that we can't use um, these masses of carbon dioxide and water to figure out oxygen is because we are burning in an excess of oxygen. You can use as much oxygen as you want in this reaction. Um, so that's not really helping us to figure out how much oxygen was in our fuel. So we'll use, um, like I said, we'll use carbon dioxide to figure out carbon. We'll use water to figure out hydrogen. And then we'll subtract from the initial value of our, our sample to figure out how much oxygen was in there. So we're just going to do some stoichiometry, really, or some, you know, um, some just kind of unit conversions to figure out how much carbon was in our carbon dioxide. So we have um, 1.6004 grams of carbon dioxide. And so we'll use the molar mass of carbon dioxide. And I'm going to use um, a couple more digits uh, just so that I'm not limited by my significant figures here. So we'll use our molar mass to change grams of carbon dioxide into moles of carbon dioxide. And for every one mole of carbon dioxide, we have one mole of carbon, right? Because there's uh, that one as a subscript for carbon in carbon dioxide. And then for every one mole of carbon, we have, um, and again, I'm going to use a couple more significant figures here. So for every one mole of carbon, we have 12-ish grams of carbon. So we used, uh, just to recap, we used grams, um, the molar mass to find moles of carbon dioxide. And then we use the ratio. There's one carbon in every one carbon dioxide. For every one carbon, we have essentially 12 grams of carbon. And that will get us our mass of carbon that's in the sample. Okay, and again, pay attention to significant figures here, just to make sure everything comes out mathematically and you're not having any rounding errors. So there's our mass of carbon, and then we'll do the same thing with water to figure out how much hydrogen is in our water. So we'll take our mass of water, and we'll use our molar mass of water to figure out how many moles of water we have. Again, using a bit more, a few more significant figures in our masses here, just so we're not limiting our sig figs. So that will turn it into moles of water. And then again, using our ratio for, from before, for every one mole of water, we have two moles of hydrogen, right? Because the subscript on hydrogen here is a two. And then for every one hydrogen, we have our mass of hydrogen. And then we can go ahead and multiply that out. All right, so now we have our mass of carbon, we have our mass of hydrogen, and we can subtract to figure out how much oxygen there was. So we'll take our initial mass of our compound. And it said that our compound contained only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if we subtract out the carbon, and we subtract out the ox or the hydrogen, sorry, then we will get our mass of oxygen. So we can use this combustion analysis to essentially get us to the starting point of where we would do um, the empirical formulas. So it's just the same as that empirical formula calculations from earlier. Just we have to go and find out, okay, how many grams of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen am I actually starting with? So this whole process that we just did here was just to get us to the starting point of the empirical formula process. So now we can go through, this is the same problem, I just wrote it up there again. 
Um, now we can go through and actually figure out, okay, let's figure out the empirical formula. So we'll take all of those masses from before. So again, our first step is to, whoop, sorry. Our first step is to use the molar masses of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen to turn them into moles. So we'll go ahead and do that. I'm using um, more sig figs again, just so I'm not limited by my significant figures. So after we write down all of our molar masses, we can go ahead and divide them up. Oops, let's write that better. All right, so after we get all of the moles, then we are going to divide by the smallest number of moles. So again, that looks like it's oxygen. So we're gonna divide all of these numbers by 0 0.01818. And once we divide them by that number, that will give us our ratios. So this gives us two carbons, four hydrogens, and one oxygen. So now, since these all came out as whole numbers, we don't need to do that step where we multiply by anything. That's just to get rid of decimals. So these are going to be our ratios. So our empirical formula is going to be C2H4O. And that would be the empirical formula of this mystery compound, right? This mystery fuel. And then if we had the molecular formula, we could use our empirical mass to figure out the ratio and find the molecular formula. So I know these problems are long, um, but they always follow the same series of steps. So once you know the series of steps and get really good at them, they are actually really nice problems, um, but they are, they are long. So you're going to need to practice them um, and get really used to them. And that's the end. Um, so go ahead, find your chapter three lecture worksheet and do a ton of these practice problems. The chapter three lecture worksheet and worksheets from beyond this, you'll start to notice are getting longer. And the reason that they are getting longer is because you're going to need more practice. The problems start to get tougher and tougher as we go throughout the course. So I've provided more and more practice problems for you so that you get good at them. Um, chemistry is a lot easier once you kind of master the math. So make sure you're doing all those chapter lecture worksheet problems. Make sure you are checking your answers against the answer key. And like I said, I would recommend doing that before you try the Alex homeworks. The Alex homeworks are tougher than the problems on the lecture worksheets. Uh, most times, not always, but a lot of times. And you don't have the answer key to help you out. So if you find yourself getting frustrated with the Alex homework assignments, make sure you're doing all of these lecture worksheets. That's always the first thing I ask people when they ask me for help with Alex is how are the lecture worksheets going? If those are going well, then I can help you out with your Alex. But the first part is to, you know, make sure that you are doing the practice. So keep working hard. And as always, send me any questions.